He also wrote, what Jacob Liff, the article is, Flaming Commitment States in the Convention Against Torture in the Journal of Politics. So please welcome both of our speakers today. We're excited to have them. Allie, thank you very much for that great introduction, and thank you to the Federalist Society of BYU Law School for putting together this event. I'm thrilled to see such a great turnout. Um, I want to say thank you to a few members of the club in particular who have been very hospitable and very helpful in putting this together. Uh, Matthew Bell, Josh Jones, uh, Jessica, Jessica Smith, I mean Hawk, most uh, uh, hospitable. We were at Sundance last night for dinner, beautiful place, so happy to have been there for the first time. Uh, Kara Bloom, uh, Jake Brock, helping us with AB, and of course, Professor, Professor Hawkins, thank you very much for being here and uh, getting ready to pounce on my every word. <laughs> and thank you all of you. I know each and every one of you has a little bit of homework, probably a little bit of reading, and taking time to be here with us to think about these things. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so today's topic is income inequality. Does it stack up? I'd like to start today with a thought experiment. So let me ask you guys, uh, some of you are three L's, we're about to graduate. Some of you will be summer associates before long. And as you think about what you want to do when you get out of here, either for the semester or once you're finished at BYU, uh, one of the things you'll think about is what you get paid. And this, of course, goes to the core of what we talk about when we discuss income inequality. So let's say you're considering a couple job offers. One is from uh, firm A. And your choices are uh, you will make $50,000 and your boss will make $55,000. That's an income inequality level of 10%. And I think Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders could live with that. It's not 10%. That's OK. That's not so bad. That's job offer A. Job offer B, another firm. You make $500,000, but your boss makes a million dollars. That's an income inequality level of 100%. That SOB in the corner office making twice what you are. Unbelievable level of income inequality. So let me ask you guys, how many of you would accept job offer A? How many would accept a job offer B? Wow. So I guess it really isn't about income inequality after all, is it? <laughs> so this is a, a topic we've heard lots about income inequality, and oh my god, the rich are making so much, and on and on and on. Uh, I think that the problem with income inequality as a topic, as a theme, is it focuses on the wrong problem, or at least the wrong end of the problem. When we talk about equality, we have good equality. I believe very much, as I hope you do, in equal justice under law. This is one of the core bases of the American creed and one of the things that's at the base of our entire legal system. Everybody who stands before government is equal, no matter whether you're uh, male, female, black, white, uh, Christian, Jewish, whatever it may be. Uh, but when it comes to other types of equality, we're under big problems, such as, you know, what if we have high equality? You know, maybe we should take the tall guy here, this is John Cleese from Monty Python, and maybe cut him off at the knees and attach everything from the knees below to push him up so they're all at the same level. I mean, that's absurd and ridiculous and stupid. But if you look at what other people want to do in terms of the economy, it's kind of the same. Let's apply brute force, uh, the blunt instrument trauma of government to try to make people equal in a way that they're not and, uh, and never uh, really should be, in a sense. Uh, and this very much focuses, I'm afraid, on a very unproductive, <coughs> destructive uh, conversation, which is not how we push up the poor and make them more comfortable, more wealthy, more prosperous. The conversation, conversation seems to be how to bring people at the top and drive them down and generally do so in a way that is acrimonious and insulting and attacks them as evil people and, and awful, monstrous uh, citizens and people who are being escorted. I think that's a very unproductive discussion. This is a good discussion. This is not a very good discussion. So for example, here you see James Clyburn. He's the number three Democrat in the US House. And he says here, the gap continues to grow wider between those who enjoy great wealth and those who struggle to get by, with little thought of ever getting ahead. Also well put, I think, are these words. Instead of believing that a rising tide lifts all boats, class warriors act as if they want to drain the lake so all the boats are equally grounded. So it's not about how do we all get rich. It's all how can we just be at a very mundane level of equality, with the rich being punished to get us there. Uh, along this sort of concept, is rooted in the idea that the uh, people at top 1%, the tippy tops, as uh, Congressman Acasio Cortez calls them, um, somehow stole their money. It's a rip off, it's a, a rigged system, what have you. And you see this all throughout popular culture in the news and elsewhere. Here you have a C Burns from the Simpsons. 1% recovery, nicely for recession. 99% not so much. And of course, you couldn't feel better about that. Um, and then we have uh, your new, the junior senator from the state of Utah, Mitt Romney which makes Mike Lee the senior senator from Utah, which must drive Mitt Romney crazy, I'm sure. 
So here's Mitt Romney, and of course he has what you always see in this sort of uh, iconography. He's wearing a top hat. I have a lot of wealthy friends. They don't walk around in top hats. So there you go. Uh, and here he is holding his money and kicking the worker in the rear end because he's a bad, evil, greedy guy. Um, and you think this sort of uh, stuff stopped back in the 30s. This is a very Marxist-looking big proletariat magazine from Melbourne University. And here is again with the top hat, the uh, uh, rich, uh, wealthy plutocrat getting hit with that uh, uh, pickaxe by this worker whose sleeves rolled up. Uh, but you see this kind of rhetoric, you hear this kind of, you see these images, you hear this kind of rhetoric in American politics all the time. Here's uh, Obama back in uh, 2010. I do think at a certain point, you've made enough money. So you've made enough money, I guess the government should take it after that. If you've got a business, you didn't know that. Somebody else made that happen. I think this is one of the ugliest things this man said across his eight years. Here's Bernie Sanders. When the rich get richer, they say, I'm not rich enough. I need to be richer. What motivates some of these people's greed and greed and more greed, these awful monsters. And here is the uh, almost president of the United States. Uh, the wealthiest 1% must be toppled, toppled to save the US economy. That's a pretty rough term. And here's the woman who currently runs the Democrat Party, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She says it, and so the Democrats say, yeah, that's our, our new line. Uh, it's immoral for a system of law billionaires amid poverty that you see in certain pockets of the country. It's a matter of immorality. I mentioned Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren. She attacked NFL owner uh, Dan Snyder. He paid $100 million for a super yacht with its own IMAX theater. I'm pretty sure he can pay, me, pay my new ultra-millionaire tax to help the millions of yachtless Americans struggling with student loan debt. So it's not a program to help poor people get into their own voting pro programs. It's let's attack the guy who's got the big yacht. A uh, very good rejoinder by Ryan Saavedra. Uh, he said, NFL billionaire buys a $100 million yacht, which helps employ people who designed it, built it, transported building materials, manufactured building materials, mine elements needed to make building materials, etc. Those people get paid for their work, which allows them to live. And this is something that gets ignored in all of this. You attack rich people with things they have. You know, you don't just magically create a boat or magically create a, a luxury home. People build those things. People get paid for those things. So it actually was a tax by uh, President George George H. W. Bush. It was a, a, a luxury tax of 10 percent on yachts and other things. Wiped out the auto industry. People in the auto industry, industry lost jobs like crazy. And all these people said, "I just want to be able to put yachts together, paint the wood, you know, polish the brass." And all of a sudden, these people are out of jobs because we want to be fair and take uh, and, and slap a tax on yachts that blew up in uh, G. H. W. Bush's face. Here's Michael Moore, man has been sliding by his good looks for his whole career. <laughs> and he says, they're sitting on the money. That's not theirs. That's national resources. That's ours. It's not even their money. It's our money, he says. And things get a little uglier. Kill and eat the rich. I guess they're now not trade right. The other white meat, if you will. <laughs> and here's this is better. Class war. We have found new homes for the rich. Isn't that ugly? Now, what if we said, um, uh, well, I don't know, uh, sexual orientation war, we've got new, new homes for the gays, or we've got new homes for the blacks. People would be all disgusted. Whoever did this would mean that this person's career. If you attack the rich this way, and people high-five you for that. Burn the rich. Burn the condos. And there actually have been homes burned down, luxury homes burned down, as a means of attacking the wealth. This is lovely. A New York State lawmaker received a threatening email saying it was, quote, time to kill the wealthy if they did not renew the state's tax surcharge on millionaires. And the death threat continued, if you don't, I'm going to pay a visit with my carbine to one of those tech companies you're so proud of and shoot every spoiled Ivy League blank I can find. So it goes from, you know, let's just tax these people some to let's hurt them, and some people think they actually need to be wiped up physically. Now all of this points to something uh, which is one of the cardinal sins. Now far be it for me as a man from Manhattan to come and tell people pro about sin. Hard <laughs> line. But one of these is a cardinal sin, which is the sin of envy. I think that this whole thing is about envy. It's not about, again, helping poor people get better. It's those people have something we want, we're going to grab it, and that's envious. And I looked on Google Images to find a picture which would summarize envy very well. And I think this one does it best. <laughs> you can see the look on her face. It's all about, uh, you have something I want, I'm going to take it. Uh, not about help myself, but let me grab something from you. And I think that's, that whole mentality fuels uh, this entire debate, unfortunately. Uh, for example, here again, you have James Clyburn, number three man in the House of Representatives. 98% of the American people are carrying this tax load, while the other 2% seem, not to be, seem, to, seem to be getting away scot-free, and that's not fair. Now, the only problem with this argument from the number three 
man, and U.S. House of Representatives, number three Democrat, is that it has it 180 degrees upside down. He stood on his head and started doing some thinking he would probably get it right. So who are the top 1%? Uh, these are the most recent figures from the IRS. There's always a lag with government figures, usually. Uh, so the top 1% have a minimum adjusted gross income of about $481,000, and an average gross, uh, adjusted gross income of, uh, income of about $1.5 million, approximately. So here's the top 1%, those folks in red. Now, what do they make? They make 21% of national adjusted gro gro uh, adjusted gross income. So basically, 21% of national health income is held by the top 1%. And yes, that is a big number. But the whole argument is they don't pay their fair share. These people are just sliding by. They're cheating. And if they pay 39% of income taxes, how about that? So they make 21% of the money, they pay almost 40% of income tax. So that seems to me the idea that the top 1% do not pay their fair share. They're making 21% of national income, paying 39% of income tax. I think they're paying more than their fair share of income taxes. And in fact, 45% of Americans pay no federal income tax. They're just not, uh, we don't collect any money for them for any of our national services. The bottom 50% of people who pay taxes pay 3% of national income taxes. So these numbers don't come up when we bring up this figure of how the richers are robbing the poor. It's actually the rich pay more than they should, and the poor pay very, very little in terms of taxes. But the bottom 50% not just the poor. These people are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Maybe they've got to go back to the Bible or whatever they believe in, in understanding that there is virtue in sharing and reaching out that you, can, you can't you can get it all. Again, this idea that these people are grabbing things, holding it all, this tremendous avarice. There's an excellent uh, study done every year by <coughs> Bank of America, U.S. Trust, and the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at the University of Indiana. And they do a study of high net worth philanthropy. They talk to very wealthy people and ask them what they do with their money. And in the last survey, they asked 1,646 U.S. households with median annual household income of about 350000 and median net worth of $2 million. So these are millionaires, multi-millionaires. What do you do with your money? Well, guess what? 90% of them give money to charity, compared to 56% of regular folks. So the idea they're hanging on to this money and stuffing it under their mattress is not true. Well, how much do they give? In 2017, on average, they gave $29,000 change. That was a 15% increase uh, from 2015, compared to average taxpayers who went down from 2520 to 2514. So you're thinking, okay, these people give money to the ballet, they give to the symphonies, they can hang out and listen to Rachmaninoff and Beethoven and Dvorak with their rich friends. In fact, where did their money go? Number one, basic needs. Salvation Army, homeless shelters, nutrition for the poor, Basic services for poor people. Number two, religious and spiritual, in either churches, synagogues, what have you. Three, health care. Let's take care of the sick people. Combined charities, charities that do a number of things like United Way, youth or family services, taking care of young people. And then all the way down at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we get the ballet, the symphony, and all the uh, high food and high breath stuff. They even give more money to animals, animal relief they give to arts and culture. Big deal, you get money, you write a check, who cares, so what? Well, guess what these people do? They give time. They don't just write checks, drop them in the mail, and say, all right, I've done my duty, I can go back to my, my green hedge fund. These people take time off from their very busy and very productive and very profitable lives, and they take time to volunteer uh, for organizations, to be on uh, boards, uh, to help raise money, to do administrative support, to do coaching. So these people actually give time, which if you're making millions and millions, is worth a lot of money and they get zero credit for that. They give to tremendous causes, such as Elon Musk, a very interesting gentleman. He's given money to the Flint schools to uh, to receive water stations and clean up this whole mess where they have got a lot of land in the water supply. Elon Musk could contribute, contributed money for that. Uh, Ken Langone is the co-founder of Home Depot. He's a multi-billionaire. He gave, I think the number was $225-$200 million dollars to the uh, New York University, my alma mater. And this was to uh, create a brain hospital, uh, medical training, and so on. And the only thing he asked is, here's my money, $200, $250 million, and just put my name on the school. So it's out of Ken Lund's own medical center. So you can point to it, so I'll for that. Uh, but you've got people who are training to become doctors, people who are going there sick and coming out better, new drugs and treatments being created, et cetera, and that's because of his tremendous philanthropy. Uh, one of the worst and worst of the top 1% were the most evil, monstrous, multi-billionaires in this country, the terribly evil David Koch. 
one of the Koch brothers. You've heard about the terrible nemesis. This awful man here has given $600 million throughout his lifetime to cancer research, 60% of a billion for cancer research. He also paid, I think it was $100 million to renovate the New York State Theater, which is part of the Lincoln Center complex. And uh, it's now been renovated and fixed up, and it's absolutely beautiful. That's thanks to a $100 million check for that horrible David Koch. Now, what about regular folks? I've talked about some very rich people, but what about regular people? Record of history is absolutely crystal clear, says Milton Friedman, the Nobel laureate economist. There is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by the free enterprise system. I think that's absolutely correct. Let me show you how this has worked throughout history. Over the last 2,000 years, uh, the world GDP per capita has been completely flat, as you can see. Flat, 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 flat. And then it suddenly starts charging up. What happened in the late 1700s, early 1800s? Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, the idea of capitalism was born, and the Industrial Revolution occurred. And people suddenly were able to use their productive capacities, uh, machinery, all sorts of uh, innovations to create wealth, expand wealth, and you see it just climb, 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 climb like that after having been flat for 1800 years. What has this done for poverty? Economic growth and capitalism. As you can see, back in 1820, 94% of the world's population is living in extreme poverty. And down, 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 down it goes until you can see in the year 2015, it's dropped all the way down to 9.6%, about a 90% drop in extreme poverty worldwide. Thanks again to <coughs> capitalism and the industrial age and economic production. Unfortunately, under Obama, we had very little economic growth. The economy grew at about 1.92% on average. Ta-da, it moved. Look, it moved again and again. Back a tiny bit, but it moved as the economy moved along at snail's pace for eight years. This had a tremendously negative impact on jobs. This shows uh, the amount of jobs created in the Obama recovery versus the average, average recovery or a Reagan level recovery. And you can see that between the uh, Obama's economic level and the economy we saw under Reagan, 12 million jobs were lost, or 12 million jobs were not created. Maybe that's a more accurate way to put it. If you had Reagan-like conditions under Obama, you would have had all of the things being built. 12 million more people at work, paying their bills, taking care of their loved ones, giving to charity, being happy. <coughs> the Congress was 12 million fewer people working under Obama who were not paying their bills at home, miserable, and not very content. What have we seen in the last year and change? Uh, President Trump signed the jobs uh, uh, jobs cut and tax, uh, jobs, jobs and tax cut act, sorry, of uh, 2017. And this also was coupled uh, with uh, tremendous deregulation uh, reduction in all sorts of red tape across the board. What's been the result of this? You've seen the GDP, which is flat to fall under Obama, take off like a rocket under uh, President Trump. And as you can see, I don't have the figures for uh, the most recent report that came out Friday. I was at Deer Valley, sorry. Uh, <laughs> But uh, as of the previous couple days before, the uh, unemployment uh, report for the previous month, the U.S. economy added 312,000 jobs in December. Wage growth gained steam, marking a strong finish in 2018. And according to the Wall Street Journal, they had a wonderful letter of jobs for the, for, for the forgotten man. Wage increases are reaching even unskilled corners of the labor force. The labor report could hardly have been better, 312,000 new jobs. Um, Upward revision for October, 58,000. Uh, 419,000 workers uh, joining the uh, labor work, the labor force. 320,000 jobs added in manufacturing. Uh, wages uh, going up, uh, manufacturing 23%. And uh, it says here, uh, 200, uh, manufacturing employment fell by 210,000 during Barack Obama's two terms. It has risen by 473,000 jobs in Donald Trump's first two years. So people talk about, we've got to help out manufacturing, huge growth in manufacturing uh, jobs. And in terms of wages, employers are also paying more as average, average hourly earnings rose again, are now up 3.2% in the last year. That's the fastest rate since the fight uh, before the financial panic, and it looks set to continue as businesses compete to hire and attain the best workers. Excellent news for folks at the bottom who are trying to move up. Because of the tax cuts, there have been tremendous bonuses paid. To workers, this is Disney uh, giving out $125 million in bonuses due to Trump's tax cuts. Uh, the folks at Disney admit that themselves. These companies have all given bonuses and uh, uh, wage increases, um, donations to charity, job training, all sorts of benefits to workers, among hey. others. Americans for Tax Reform has 750, 750 examples 
of companies that have given raises, given to charity, paid some bonuses, matched 401ks, expanded their businesses, provided training, et cetera, et cetera, all thanks to the Trump tax cuts. And in fact, thanks to Republican tax cuts, 90% of wage earners have higher take-home pay. That's a tremendous imp improvement in the lives of regular Americans. Uh, a huge aspect of this has to be education. Uh, that's a long topic to get into, but just very briefly, uh, I think it is vital if you want to see people move up the ladder that they be educated. Unfortunately, the government school system holds a lot of people down because they spend a lot of money, twenty, twenty, three thousand dollars per people per pupil. The students don't learn very much and they can't get ahead because they don't have the uh, educational background and skills, etc. that they need to move up. Uh, that is a national emergency. I call it institutionalized child abuse. And the more we can do to expand choice and options and quality and high standards in American government education, the better. The more kids like this will succeed and rise and prosper. Um, Elizabeth, uh, so Betsy McCoy, she was the Lieutenant Governor of uh, New York State, and she wrote this in the New York Post until last week. A child in poverty whose parent has a high school degree or better has a 70% shot at rising out of poverty, according to Brookings Institution. If a parent is a college grad, the chances increase to 84%. Education beats handouts when it comes to escaping poverty. So the more we can do, uh, to improve educational chances for uh, poor and average uh, students and children, the better. Excellent words by Winston Churchill. The inherent vice of capitalism is the, is the unequal sharing of blessings. The inherent, the inherent virtue of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. So let's not share miseries. Let's try to have uh, sharing of blessings, even though they may be unequal. Anybody know what that is? This is the Korean Peninsula by day. And this is the Korean Peninsula by night. Okay. So there's a lot of inequality here. I'm sure there are people here living in tiny homes. Some people are living in uh, shelters, shacks, whatever. Other people are living in huge, beautiful homes and condos and penthouses, apartments, etc. A lot of inequality. You want equality? Look up here. They're pretty equal in North Korea, aren't they? Now they're miserable, but they're equal. So you want income equality? You got it there. You want income inequality? You've got it here. Okay. I think I'd rather be in the South. Thank you. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot help the poor man by destroying the rich. You cannot further the brother of man by inciting class hatred. Words attributed to President Abraham Lincoln. Words <laughs> words then, and wise words today. Thank you very much. This might take me a minute. I wasn't able to prepare beforehand, so maybe forgive me for a minute while I pull up the PowerPoint here. Log into my and I'll see what's going on in my email. Yeah, I'm So, um, okay, mic is on, right? Okay. So, uh, thanks for having me here today. Nice to see everyone. Um, I am, my name is Darren Hawkins. I'm in the political science department here at BYU, and I really do appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a number of things that I, you might be all, let me lower expectations. You might all be very bored because there are a number of things that I don't disagree with, right? Um, I mean, I am not going to stand up here and defend people who attack the rich. Um, I don't care for the people who attack the rich either. Uh, they don't make a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, people who want to topple the 1%, yeah, that doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, an idea that it's immoral to allow billionaires, that doesn't make much sense to me. So I'm sorry if I'm a disappointment. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I let the organizers know that, you know, 
my point of view is, uh, uh, so the second half of the talk got into more what I want to address. Um, uh, because uh, the organizers said that this would be more of a focus on government programs and whether or not um, government programs could uh, were, were a good way to uh, approach the inequality problem in our society. And the second half of your presentation certainly got into, into that uh, more. Um, but I also warned them that uh, I am, above all, uh, in favor of evidence. So um, I appreciated the sharing of evidence. Um, I would critique it as a little bit limited. <laughs> uh, and so my critique is going to be sort of intellectual and sort of scientific. Um, so there's not going to be a lot of blood on the floor, sadly. Sorry. <laughs> um, go, go now if that's what you're hoping for. Um, so uh, one approach to government programs and inequality is to theorize. And, uh, and um, we have certainly heard some theories, right, about how from Milton Friedman, for example, that uh, a free society enables people to grow to their best potential and so forth, okay? Well, I, I certainly think theorizing is important, but why stop there? Um, if we can learn more about actual effects using evidence, why not do that? So something more than theory is important. Um, so these are some empirical questions that I'm interested in. Uh, a lot of the introduction was sort of about my previous work. You know, my first 10, 15 years of my career was on international law and international organizations. More recently, I've turned to de development questions. And so, uh, so here's some empirical questions that I think have been studied that I think are very interesting. What effects do conditional cash transfers have on early childhood development? A conditional cash transfer is sort of all the rage these days as a government program to help inequality kinds of programs, right? And uh, this is, so lots of countries are providing conditional cash transfers. Um, what that means is that uh, we will give a family some cash if they do certain kinds of things. The kinds of things that families often need to do is send their kids to school, get immunizations, get checkups, things like this. These Now, I know more about the developing world than I know about the United States, right? So I'm going to talk about the developing world. Um, I think the issues are similar, though. So, you know, that's, but I know, happen to know more about it. So conditional cash transfers is a very widespread program in lots of Latin America. Um, what do public works programs, how do public works impact programs impact the lives of youth and the households who participate? I think that's an interesting, these are empirical questions, right? We can get evidence on these kinds of things. And I think that's what we want to do, okay? What effect does government business assistance have on artists and business productivity? And, I, you know, I think that uh, Milton Friedman might have some answers to these questions in theory. He might say, well, I would expect a poor effect from government business assistance. I would uh, expect a poor effect from public works programs. <coughs> That's in theory. I think we need to study these empirically. Uh, how does a work and training program for low-income populations affect their work situation? Okay, these are very empirical questions. So, you know, um, you didn't even mention Thatcher, so that's what they told me you were going to talk about, but okay. Um, let's not worry about that, Thatcher then. Um, so, uh, scholars have produced uh, thousands of studies that answer these sorts of empirical questions uh, and that ask about the impact of government policies on individuals. Now, uh, the type of evidence that you introduced, while respectable and important, is only one kind of evidence. It's, it's quantitative correlative evidence. The gold standard these days, I would say, is randomized control trials or experiments. Now, you can't do an experiment on national economies, but you can do experiments on individuals. And that's what I'm more interested in. That's why macroeconomic policy to me, macroeconomic kinds of things, the sorts of things that, that you address, they're super important. Uh, but we always have doubt because we can't observe. There's a fundamental problem causal inference, right? We cannot observe our country currently with a different president. So we don't know precisely. We don't know precisely whether it's Trump or whether it's something else that might be causing these happy outcomes. We can't be sure, right? Because we cannot observe a world in which Trump is not president. 
Um, we can compare it historically to Obama or something, but we still can't be certain because Obama had very different conditions than Trump does. And I'm not saying that Trump is not to credit, I'm just saying we should doubt that proposition because the evidence can't be foolproof. And when you do experiments, the evidence can be more foolproof. You can have a control group and a treatment group. And just like medical doctors do, they provide the treatment group with a drug, and they provide the control group with a placebo. And then they say, which one works better? Well, we can do the same thing in the social sciences, right? We can provide a treatment group with a particular government policy. We can provide a control group with the market or with the status quo or with whatever, and then we can observe the difference. And if the treatment group does better than the control group, we can say with relatively high confidence that that program might work. So what I have done, there are thousands of these studies out there, and what I have done is I have created a website called impactevidence.org. So let me open that. Um, that summarizes these, uh, these hundreds of studies, hundreds so far, I'm, I'm working on the thousands. Um, the hundreds of studies, and why is it not up there? <coughs> Do I need to change the, oh, it's because I probably have to quit out of my, the, the PowerPoint is controlling this? Just drag it? Drag it which way? That way. But then I can't manipulate it. <laughs> um, no ideas about how to solve this problem? Yeah, I see it, but I can't. It's on a different screen up here, so I can't. Yeah. I have to duplicate it instead of um, image it or something, whatever. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so this is my website. What this is is this is the world's most completely accessible co collection of high quality policy impact information. So, if we want to see if government programs work, let's run randomized control trials on them. Well, scholars have done hundreds of these randomized, and thousands of these randomized control trials in lots of countries around the world. I'm interested in developing countries, so these all have to do with development. But, um, you know, I just thought, you know, because I do believe in science, and I'm not, trying to, uh, I'm not trying to game the results here, I thought, well, what if we just take a look, okay? So let's just see, I didn't look at these much beforehand, but let's just see, let's see what public works stuff. Okay, I got 16, public works kinds of programs. Okay, we've got all kinds of studies in here. But what effect did public works programs have on food security in Malawi? This was done in 2015. Um, so these are poor able-bodied households and villages that requested public works programs. The main insight that we pulled out of this, you know, so this is a scholarly study. So my, uh, my contribution to the world is that you do not have to read this <laughs> to figure out what the answer, you especially do not have to read that. Uh, so uh, to figure out what the answer is to this particular question, because we have pulled out the relevant information, the relevant evidence for you, and you don't have to even read all this stuff, you can just look at our nice website, and you can see that what they said here, public works programs had little influence on improving food security. And, uh, and even had even slightly negative effects on untreated households. Okay, so here we have some evidence that this public works program in particular did not work. Um, so participants lived in villages that had access to public works programs. Uh, their food, so here's the food, here's the food insecurity score of people with no public works program. This is the food insecurity score on an index. We don't know precisely what that means. We could figure it out. But this is the food insecurity score of people who had no public works program. This is the food insecurity score of people who did have a public works program. This is one who had, uh, they were allowed to, so this is if the, if the public works program were in your village, this is if you had access to it. I'm not sure what precisely was the nature of the public works program. We don't have a lot of time for this. I just want to illustrate the principle 
that it is possible that I believe that these kinds of questions are empirical questions, not theoretical questions. And we have tools at our disposal to answer them clearly and succinctly. And I would, and I would hope that as you encounter people who make claims like government programs are bad for poor people, or government, government program X is bad for a poor person, or bad for the economy, that you would ask hard questions. And say, OK, have you run an experiment on that? How do we know that? What is true here? Because here is, a, for example, what impact do unemployment and unjob training have on the likelihood of participants stealing? So here's an urban youth employment program. So here they don't get any training. This is where they involved in stealing. So uh, lower numbers would be better. No training. Here we have an urban youth employment project. Um, and we can see what this consisted of. Less educated youth were provided short-term public works employment. Youth with more education received pre-employment training followed by on-the-job training in various sectors. All youth participated in one-week basic life skills training at the start of the program. So Milton Friedman would say, no, that doesn't work. Yes, it does. Uh, we've got evidence here that stealing goes down when people get a little bit of public works programs. So is the best solution for the government to simply stay out of people's lives? I don't know. Let's test that. Let's come up with detailed programs. Let's see if they work. Some programs might work better than others. Let's try it. That's what I've got. I can keep going forever. <laughs> I wish we had forever, we've only got an hour. I mean, you can leave that, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for your comments. Very uh, interesting, provocative, and um, just as you did not, uh, just as you do not agree with, disagree with me on um, <clears throat> torturing millionaires, I don't disagree with you <laughs> on the idea that we should try to look at evidence and present evidence and think about evidence uh, to advance or defend or critique or whatever proposition people raise. I think we're, we agree on that. Um, I do think in turn, you mentioned a couple things to which I'll respond briefly, and we'll take questions for as many as we have. Uh, you mentioned conditional cash transfers, and you're interest, interested in that. Um, I think that also overlaps with some of what I'm saying, the need to look at evidence and so on. Uh, one of the points that people, libertarians, free market people like me make is, if you are going to have a government program, let's focus the program on poor people, people who need help. And if we're going to take our national resources, our state or local resources, help people who need help and don't have other options, rather than what, rather than what we do a lot in this country, just throw them around all over the place, willy-nilly. <coughs> Uh, for example, one of the things Obama did <clears throat> was expand uh, eligibility for food stamps from the previous poor population all the way up, I think, I'm not mistaken, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it was a family for up to $75,000. That was huge. Now, I'd much rather have a focused program that focuses on poor people who are not eating and spend significant money to bring them up than to say, all right, your family for making $75,000, you are doing just fine, you're eating well, but here, have some, have some government cash, knock yourselves out. I think that's a totally in, uh, inappropriate, absurd uh, use of government money. Uh, I'd much rather focus on people who don't have other options and really need the help. Um, another example is farm aid. The farm bill uh, that was signed, President Trump signed, I think in December, I believe there's an amendment there uh, by some people who said, let's limit farm assistance to people who make a million dollars or less. So if you're getting any farm subsidies and you make more than a million, you're, you're, you're cut off. That amendment failed. So now we're continuing to give farm subsidies to millionaires. Uh, there also was a, a successful effort to expand it, not just to people who are working the farms and their children, but now nieces and nephews. So you don't have to be on the farm. You can be a niece or nephew, and you get government farming. Again, this is, to me, crazy. Uh, we have the, an excellent website, one evidence, terrific evidence from something called the Environmental Working Group. They have a wonderful website, and they've been able to take all the uh, checks through the Department of Agriculture for farm subsidies, and they see where the check goes just by basis of zip code. And you think the zip codes would be in Indiana, Iowa, Southern Illinois. They, they definitely get a lot of money. A lot of money also goes to my zip code, 1003 East Village, New York City, Manhattan. I don't see any farm equipment there, but my neighbors are getting checks for farm subsidies. I looked up uh, 90270, or, uh, which is uh, Beverly Hills 90270. I mean, it was such a rich zip code, they did a whole show about it. 
Uh, and you've got the children and grandchildren of movie stars getting farm subsidies. Uh, does anybody know, know the name Jack Benny? One or two. Yeah. Isn't it sad how Jack Benny's falling down the memory hole? Jack Benny is a tremendous comedian. If you guys want to spend some time on YouTube, look up Jack Benny. He was tremendous, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I think he died. This year. Very funny man. Nobody remembers him anymore. Uh, he died in 1974. And as of a few years ago, his grandchildren were getting farm subsidies from Jack Benny's previous program. I guess Jack Benny bought a farm as, a, as, a benefit, as a, an investment. Uh, he's been dead for 44 years, but his grandchildren are still getting farm subsidies, even though Grandpa died 44 years ago. This is crazy. Um, let's see. In terms of experiments, you made a comment about uh, you can't do an experiment on the national economy because you always have the condition that Obama is president or Trump is president. That's very true. It reminds me of a, a woman who was walking through Red Square, <clears throat> and she ran into, uh, into Mikhail Gorbachev. And she said, Comrade Gorbachev, I have a question. He says, I guess, but what is it? And uh, she says, uh, was communism started by a politician or by a scientist? And he says, Mary, she said, well, it was started by a politician. She said, ah, that explains everything. A scientist would have tried it out on mice first. <laughs> So yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> I wish I'd done that back in 1917. So it's very hard to do a national experiment. We certainly could do not exact precise experiments, but something uh, relatively close in this country, state by state. Uh, so Utah versus Arizona, New York versus Florida, whatever it is. And you can look at evidence. I don't have in front of me any exact figures, but people have looked, for example, at I state taxes like New York, uh, Michigan, Illinois, low tax or no tax, no income tax states like Arizona, Florida, Texas. I can tell you, you definitely see very clearly moving bands leaving the coal high tech high tech north into the warmer low, uh, low tax south. Uh, people are flooding out of New York, New Jersey, where I live, uh, going to Florida, Texas, Arizona, where they have either uh, no income tax or very low income tax. And what's interesting about this also, not just the economic impact, but the political impact. A lot of these, these people leave the high tax high tax states, move to low tax states. They're very happy to see those tax cuts. And then in November, they go Democrat. And all of a sudden, you see, for example, um, in Arizona, you've got uh, Kristen Sinema being elected uh, to the uh, U.S. Senate. Uh, uh, Robert Francis Orr almost winning, almost beating Ted Cruz in Texas. Came very close. And the idea that someone as far left as, as Orr would do as well as he did is, I think, a reflection of the fact that a lot of people from high tax states have moved to Texas where there's no income tax, but then they continue to vote Democrat. So I think that's, uh, that's evidence of what uh, the evidence we should explore when we look at these questions. I think uh, that's it uh, for that response, but we will, I'll be happy to answer questions until I'm told to stop. Oh, we're going to give Professor Hawkins a couple of yes. comments. Oh, okay. So, 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 so. I'm not sure I have a whole lot. I'm not, sorry, here we go. There we go. I'm not sure I have a whole lot to say. Um, uh, I, uh, um, let's see, what should I say? I mean, I asked for a little response time here at the end, so it seems like I ought to be able to use it. <laughs> um, but, but it's been such a, 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 a good exchange of ideas that I don't have a lot to argue with you about. Go ahead, go ahead, so, so, uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, go back home. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a very nice... I mean, so, so here's what I think that... I don't know if I heard you. Here's what. Here's the point that I think we both agree on. So we both seem to agree on evidence, and we both agree on government programs. So you know, most of these, most of the government programs that I'm interested in are um, those that target poor people. And it sounds like you're interested in doing something there as well. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that, right? Um, but there, are, there is an inherent, I, I think I agree with you, there is an inherent danger to government programs is that they take on a life of their own, right? And, and that was your point. Uh, and, and they do, and they require bureaucracy and so forth, and, that, 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 and, and, and once you get into that, it can create a lot of problems. So, yeah, I mean, I just don't disagree with you, but I do, I do feel strongly that it's definitely worthwhile <coughs> To, um, to ask really hard questions about whether or not these work, and the answers oftentimes surprise me, right? I often think, okay, this is going to work and this isn't, and uh, I, I, so this is just a, a yet another statement in favor of being careful and being open-minded about these kinds of issues. Do you have time for one or two questions?
Very quick questions. Uh, why don't you stand and tell us who you are and ask your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Jerem. Hi, Jerem. I'm a 2L here at Brigham Young University Law School. Um, so my question is, it seems to me that if, and I agree with everything you said, but it seems to me if one person in this country controlled 99% of the wealth, then we would want to do something to redistribute that wealth amongst other people. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? And what implications does that have for how we structure the tax system? Interesting question, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> I would say in your hypothetical, hypothetical um, question, the only way you'd see one person controlling 99% of the wealth would be in <clears throat> some sort of a dictatorship or monarchy or something like that. Uh, if somebody gets 99% of the money, that person probably is, is making it impossible for other people to get it. 2% or 3% or 5 or 10 or 20%, whatever it is. Um, so I think if, if that were the case, uh, you know, uh, we, we might be mixing up Molotov cocktails, uh, having secret meetings and stuff like that. Uh, now, th uh, theoretically, if somehow this person, let's say it's Jeff Bezos, and he just came up with an even better Amazon, and just gobbled up everything else, um, and I don't know who necessarily want to go and kill him. Um, but I, I always think that the best way to handle these things is to have more people doing productive things rather than going out and have the numbers. I think the 99% is interesting. Um, argument, but I think it's a rather hypothetical. Um, do you want to respond to that? No. Yeah. That's fine. Um, please. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Green, I'm a first year MBA student. Hi, Nathan. We did a case study last semester about Gravity Payments, a company that raised their minimum salaries to 70000 But that's not the question I really have. It was a tidbit in that case talked about how mainline salaries for an average American has been flat for the last several decades. The CEO salaries have gone up like a 300% or something. Um, how would you respond to that? That seems wrong or out of whack to me as a average worker so far in my life, but I'm just curious what you would sure. say. Thank you. So CEO pay definitely has gone up higher than average worker pay has. We've seen, the good news is that over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, increases in wages going up about 3% per annum, which is well ahead of where it's been, so we're making progress on that front. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about what the CEO is making, much more so what the average person is making. Um, so if the average person's money is going up and that person's wages are moving along, that's great. The CEO is making more money because that person's a very good executive and is managing the production and the stock price and, and keeping, the, the co keeping the company moving along and forward. That's a very good thing. Uh, and the best thing you want is not just people working for others, people working for themselves. Uh, make it, we should make it as easy for people to start their own companies, start their own enterprises, do their own thing, become their own CEOs, rather than just be employees. Uh, the other quick thing I'll mention briefly is when we talk about wages being flat, you're right, they've not been going up as really much as we like. The good news is that the buying power of the average dollar is increased. Small thing, if you want to buy a high-definition TV 10 years ago, 7 years ago, you'd have to drop you know, a, thousand, a couple thousand bucks. Now you can pick them up for a couple hundred, which means you're, even if your wages are low, you're able to buy more with that money. So that's been a very good thing. So the buying power is increased. Time for one more question? Yeah. Let's do it. And then why don't everyone just come down? Okay. I think there's a class right after. Uh, let's see. Go over here, please. That's you, with the hat. <laughs> uh, Barry Burnett, I'm a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations here in Provo. Um, Michigan State University Law School grad, class of 2001. Anyway, um, is there ever been a government program that is able to compensate for complete emotional failure, uh, any type of failure in the home? Is there any government program that's been able to compensate for emotional or family failure at home? That's very really interesting. I don't know if there's any program that's been able to correct for that. Um, I think, generally speaking, a lot of people from bad homes eventually succeed. There are a lot of successful people who came from broken homes, battered homes, violent homes, what have you. Um, I think that really the best escape hatch out of poverty, misery, misery difficulty <coughs> is education. And I, whatever we can do to help poor kids have better options and better choices and higher quality education, the better. I'll give you one example of something in New York we have. I urge you guys to look up a group called Harlem Educational Activities Fund, H-E-A-L. Harlem, Harlem Educational Activities Fund takes poor kids in Harlem. Most of them are poor. Food stamps, a school lunch program. Most, many of them don't have fathers, so that a broken home in that regard. Uh, what they do is they work with these kids after school, they tutor them, they help them with their SAT prep, they help them with college applications. Of the kids who are in this program, 100% graduate high school, 100%. We're talking about poor black and Hispanic kids. Uh, they have taken, uh, they've done uh, chess competitions and other things. They've done better than kids in East Hampton, which is rich white kids, almost exclusively. Uh, they all go on to college, and I think 85% uh, of them graduate within five years. 
uh, about 35% going to graduate school. So I don't know, if, but that's how we have a program. That's a private program that does this. But we need more things like that. Uh, we need more Harlem Educational Activities Funds all around the country. That would be a very good thing. We're